Hey, folks. Welcome to the What the Futures podcast, where we break down complex market trends into simple, actionable advice. It's your quick guide to better farming decisions. Hey folks, welcome to episode 36 of the What the Futures podcast. I hope everyone's having an outstanding week or an outstanding day whenever you're tuning into the show. Uh, This is episode number 36, of course, recorded in the UPL studio. You'd say, Ryan, what are you talking about? It doesn't look like the UPL studio behind you. Well, that's because I'm still on the road from Egg in Motion. I had a great time with the folks at UPL. They had a tremendous booth over at Egg in Motion. Thanks to everyone who stopped in. It was great. It was great to say hello and uh, to just have a conversation, put faces to names, go over all sorts of scenarios and questions you had. It was a great time had by all. So thank you so much for for stopping in. This episode, we're going to try to play some of those clips from Egg in Motion. We're going to have Trent McRae with UPL join me. We're going to have Anthony join me from John Deere. And we're even going to talk to the head commissioner of the SJHL as well. Some new announcements out of them. Uh, Of course, they are partnered with UPL. And uh, anyways, uh, a heck of a show. The sound quality is going to jump all around. Of course, I'm I'm even fighting the wind here today on the deck, uh, just outside St. Louis, Saskatchewan. But hang in for that. Uh, of course, what the futures is your uh, weekly dose of clarity in this complex world of crop marketing. We're going to have to talk about this market bounce as well in today's show. My name is Ryan Denny. I am your host. I have spent my career working with farmers across Western Canada. Uh, helping them as a marketing advisor, coach, analyst, grain buyer. Uh, I've done a few different things and I've had a great time doing it. So, of course, taking the show on the road here with the What What the Futures podcast. And I can't believe we're already at episode 36. Of course, took a break last week. Wasn't much of like a break. It was more of having issues with connections, connectivity, and to get the episode pieced together. So this is going to be a bit of a hodgepodge one. We'll try to bring some of last week's work in with this week. Uh, But of course, we got to talk about this market bounce. We have to get you guys set up on how to tackle this moving forward. Uh, But before we do that, let's turn it over to our sponsor, John Deere, and let's talk to Anthony about Easy Cow. See if we can get this one to play. All right, folks, we've got Anthony here with John Deere. We're at the Easy Cal. Easy Cal, we've got calibration uh, set up here over at Egg in Motion. Um, Anthony's going to run us through, and he said that I get to hit some of the buttons. So Yeah, it, it's it's so easy, Ryan, to do it. All right, so the way we like to think of this is as you're, as you're tending, you'll be able to take this bucket, right, and just fill it up with some product, grab it out of the truck. Uh, you put that product in this, in this yellow tub up top. Uh, and then from there, it, it's pretty easy, right? So we do call it Easy Cal for a reason. Yeah. Uh, you'd select your tanks. So on the on your park side display, you'll be able to select your tanks. Uh, with this test stand, we only have one tank. Sure. Uh, yep. So it's on a single tank part, so it's grayed out. Okay. Uh, but if you're running the 850 behind us, you'll be able to select whatever tank it is in the okay. uh, We do have the black roller in, uh, but if you want to click on that black roller, uh, so if you were running something else, you'd be able to select uh, a different color roller. If you want, you can go ahead and click that black black one. Uh, and then now it's as easy as clicking that start calibration button. Sure. You yep. ready? I'm ready. You guys ready? All right. So what this is going to do is it's going to do it. Two, two cycles of that meter to make sure that meter is full. It's then going to record the weight from this yellow tub. So that means this bucket can be swinging in the wind. It's not going to affect your calibration at all. From here, it's now going to run 15 revolutions. We've got it running pretty fast at the show here. Yeah. Uh, but those 15 revolutions are essentially just getting that weight out of the bucket. Uh, as you can see, as that as that goes, the weight's going up. It's yeah. just measuring how much product's leaving the bucket. Um, from there, it's going to give you your new MDB value. So it's as simple as now as in that checkbox. It's going to send that right to the cab. You're ready to go. Done. That's it? Done for the day. Wow. Done I can do day. it. Yeah. And then here, you're, you're probably still tending at this point. Yep. So you can take that bucket full of product, throw it in the conveyor. You don't have to carry it all the way up top and dump it in the tent. 
but there's five different awesome. Makes, makes you starting pretty easy. I can see where everyone's so excited. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks, Anthony. Thank you. All right, folks. Always great to learn about new technology here from our sponsors. I forgot to ask, if you could, if you may, uh, please hit the subscribe button. If you're listening to this on a podcast, if you're on YouTube, uh, please give us a subscribe, a like, give us some ratings, some feedback. It all helps on putting this show together. And, you know, I was chatting with Mark, who stopped by the booth last week, the UPL booth, and he said, you know what, Ryan, your show's fantastic. I appreciate everything that you're doing out there. Um, but, you know, man, if you could just shorten it up a little bit or give us 20-minute clips here and there, uh, I'd appreciate it. And so we're going to, you know, we'll see what we can do here uh, moving forward. But give us a like, hit the subscribe button. It, it certainly helps us out. Now, for housekeeping this week, housekeeping positive moments kind of blends together here a little bit. But for housekeeping, we raised a little bit of money for the Bellevue Care Home. Okay? And I want to thank everyone that placed a donation, everyone that bid. I want, I want to thank Keith. I want to uh, thank Stephen, our winning bidders. We actually donated two Lunchbox Crew subscriptions. Uh, when they went over list price, I thought, geez, you know, these guys are willing to pay a premium to get into this right now. Uh, why don't we kick those funds over to the care home and help them with their kitchen reno? We ended up raising uh, just a shade over 13000 bucks for the kitchen reno. So uh, it's going to go a long way, uh, and it's certainly going to get them a lot closer to their goal. Also pledged a donation for next July as well just to help them out. So uh, thanks to everyone who participated in that. Uh, again, folks, we are just a little podcast. Um, but hey, you know, thirteen grand is, you know, it's something. And if your community is looking for support, uh, certainly willing to, to try to figure out how we can help as well. So reach out to Ryan at whatthefuturespodcast.ca. Um, for housekeeping, that's probably going to be it. I Again, I had a great time last week at Egg in Motion. Uh, I can't thank you enough for stopping in and saying hello. Um, you know, I was having a meeting yesterday and and someone asked me, you know, what my highlight of the week was. And it was just talking to folks, seeing that um, that I had or we had helped, right? It's not just me putting this show together. I'm sure I'm the one on the microphone here. Uh, but we have some great editors behind the scenes. We have a, a great social uh, media team as well. And so it was very rewarding for me to hear from folks that we had helped them in their crop marketing and farm business decisions. That's what the show is all about. So again, I really appreciate that. Uh, so positive moments for the week. I've got a couple here, some family stuff going on. Uh, this one's from a couple weeks ago, but we had a babysitter come in. And this was our first time getting a babysitter. Finley is a, a year and a half old now, but it was the first time getting a babysitter where we, we put the kids to bed and just handed the babysitter the monitor and said, hey, you know, watch this and we'll be back in five hours. Um, and we went to a music uh, festival. We went to Ravenwood Music Festival and saw a band that we enjoy called Royal Foundry. Anyways, um, we had a great time. And so it's first time doing that. First time having a date, a night date. Usually we end up getting the babysitter and we go to like Costco, which is fine and fun as well. Uh, but it was a good time. It was it was nice to do that and to get out in the evening and, you know, dance uh, in front of the stage and, and just get a little bit wild as well. We had a good time. Um, I, the next day we took the kids to the festival. And what I realized is that when you're uh, when you go to a music festival, it doesn't matter if you're two. 20, 40, 65 years old. It doesn't matter. The result is the same. You're out there, you're in your like your your tank top or your cutoff shirt. You've uh you probably got an ice cream stain on it. You know, you got chocolate all over your mouth, maybe a little bit of vomit on your collar as well. I was just looking at Finley. He's just sitting in his little chair, just like laid back in that exact, you know, a little bit of red from the sun. You know, just in the moment. And I was thinking, dude, when I was 20 years old and I went to Craven, I looked exactly like that. You know, I had the same type of look going on. And so, you know, now that I'm reaching 40, it's not that much different, folks. So I guess music festivals, that's kind of how it goes for life. Um, yeah, they're, they're great. They're enjoyable. Uh, my other positive moment for this week, my last one. So we went and did a little family camping on my side of the family. We went up to uh, Elkridge, up to Waska Sioux. In, that, in the national park there. And uh, it was the first time I had been together with my siblings. My sister lives in in, in BC. My, my uh, brother and other sister live in Saskatchewan. It's the first time we were all kind of together in, uh, in about five years. 
just under five years. And of course, uh, all, the, all the little cousins got together. Uh, my sister had a baby earlier this year. We met her for the first time, May for the first time. So it was just a nice time. Of course, we had to fight the mosquitoes and we had to fight the horse flies and we had to stay cool, but it was a good time. And, and uh, we're certainly not going to let five years pass us by uh, again. Uh, it's important to get together as, as family for sure. Uh, all right, folks. Um, what I'm going to do now is jump into the crop marketing stuff. And then we'll get Trent uh, onto the show after that with UPL. But I know you guys want to talk markets. And we want to talk about this bounce. Now you're going to sit here and say, well, geez, Ryan, you've been telling us all along, you know, to be a seller in this market. And now it's making some of the highest levels of the summer. Like, what the heck is going on? And I'll tell you, folks, we've got a, a, a bit of a weather market going on, obviously. We're all uncomfortable with the heat. Of course, I've been living in the smoke now for the last week, but which is certainly helping a little bit. But we're uncomfortable with the heat. I was just looking at the weather maps for the Canadian prairies. It's very dry north of Edmonton. Uh, it's dry in that central part of Saskatchewan, that southern part, like, I don't know if south central would be the right way to say it. It's very dry down there. You know, we're hearing of crops aborting in southwest Saskatchewan as well with the heat. Of course, lots of crops flowering out there. Lots of canola flowering on our drive. Lots of peas flowering. It doesn't like this heat either. And so we got that going on. We've got uh, some dryness in Ukraine. Um, I, I'm hearing out of Russia, we've got some poor wheat quality coming off. Um, in the U.S., weather's been pretty darn good, but they've got a little bit of heat coming in as well now. And so we've got this little weather market, and thank goodness we do. Now, not thank goodness, because I, I don't like the impact it has on yield. It's going to shave some bushels off, for sure. But yet, there's a bunch of you listening here saying, man, I love this heat. I love that I'm getting some of this heat now. The smoke's certainly going to help us out, too, uh, a little bit. But um, the crops are behind, and there's a lot of areas that have had really, really good moisture until now. And so those guys are, I, I, you know, I talked to people that said, hey, I'm happy not to get any more moisture for, you know, for a while now. Bring on the heat and let's get these crops going. And so it's, it's like that every year across the prairies, folks. There's good areas and bad areas and everything in between. And so we've got a weather market. And thank goodness we do. Because it's going to provide you with a selling opportunity. Canola, the other day, was trading at 6.05. Oh. I had a buy order in at 6.05, and I pulled it the day before. Anyways, I had a, sh a short on. Anyway, any that's besides the point. But uh, it's now rallied to 6.78, okay? And we've got resistance here. You know, you could say a little bit at 6.80. You could say there's some at 6.96 as well, right in that range. But the, the thing here, folks, is you're getting an opportunity to do something. Now, you, you might sit here and say, well, Ryan, you know, I sold canola at 6.60 a couple weeks ago, and... You know, by golly gee, I'm, I'm just not comfortable now doing much of anything. In fact, I'm a little bit worried about production. Well, you know, you could add a call option to that contract, potentially, if it's at Bungie or Viterra or, or uh, Cargill. You could add some type of call option to that. You could protect yourself against that production worry if you have that. Um, you could also sit here and say, well, geez, I don't want to sell anymore, but I don't want to let this slip me slip past me. Like you do a put option here, right? You could actually do something to protect these prices. You know what? I've got a great Western light here on the side. I'm just going to go grab a sip. Yeah, look at that view, folks. A little smoky out here, but uh, not a bad view. Anyways, um, this is a, a, an opportunity to do something. And... When you're the most uncomfortable as a as a prairie farmer, you're sitting there saying, geez, man, this heat is terrible. It's no good. I'm not selling anything. I'm locking up the bins and other people say the same thing. More often than not, there's a selling opportunity in there. And so I would encourage you to take advantage of this in some way or fashion. You know, maybe it's to figure out how to sell some 2025 crop. Maybe it's... Uh, uh, maybe it's extending sales here. Maybe it's buying a put option. Maybe it's learning a new contract that you haven't used yet. But this is an opportunity. Summer, spring and summer bring these rallies and bring these opportunities. 
And I just want you to remember that we are still in a, a bearish trend here. Overall, a long-term bearish trend. And I'm not a believer that production has been impacted enough here to rally prices significantly moving forward. Now, we're recording this like July 23rd. And if it doesn't rain here for five weeks, then sure, in between now and then, there could be, um, you know, a scenario where I change my, my tune there and say, okay, yeah, that did have a bigger impact. We did shave a couple of million tons of production. We are going to rally up another buck or something. Like, But we're, we're flirting. We have $15 canola targets hitting now for new crop in portions of um, northwest Saskatchewan. Um you know, 14s, mid-14s, all, all over the place now. Um, and I, I can't sit here and say that the market's going to hang on to that long term. I still think we're going to make some harvest lows here that you're not going to enjoy. And you're going to sit back and say, geez, why didn't I do anything? And think of last year, folks. We had a tremendous rally. I don't have it right in front of me, but, but we had two summer rallies, right? You guys remember the $18 canola? It was the best selling opportunity we had. And maybe, just maybe, that's a similar play developing right now. Carryover is still going to be higher this year than it was last year. And it's going to be higher next year than it, than it is this year. And then my friends in the U.S. tell me the soybean crop isn't made. But they're starting to pencil in record soybean yields, record corn yields. I don't know, folks. Like... Again, I could be I could be an idiot. I might not know what I'm talking about here. But I, I believe this is going to be a selling opportunity. It is a selling opportunity to take advantage of. And I told the folks in the Lunchbox crew, I said, hey, sit tight. We're watching this market here um, to see where we're going to extend. And we're letting this market play out. And hey, you know, I, I had some farmers that wanted to uh, get some call options on, wanted to make sure that uh, their uh, behinds were covered. Um, just in case of a production issue or something like that. But, you know, I, I, yeah, there's all sorts of things you can do right now, all sorts of scenarios for you to, to look at. But I would strongly challenge you to get out of your comfort zone and figure out that contract out there that makes sense for you, where you could get a little bit more profit protected. Now, you know, I look at canola, it's doing some good things. I look at wheat, though, and what I said a few weeks ago, it just it remains the same. You know, those 30 to 40 cent rallies, and uh, and then they stall out. They, You know, spring was down like 7 cents today. I thought for sure we were going to test that high from a couple weeks ago. No dice. We just go up 30 or 40 cents, and then we pull back. It's not a surprise, folks. We, we knew that, right? We've talked about this already. But, geez, it would be nice to get wheat to pop up just a little bit here so we can make another sale, darn it. But anyways, on the wheat side, I see a quality issue brewing, not a production issue. I don't, I don't see a production issue that concerns me at all anywhere. It'd be nice to see a bit more demand out of India, but I see a quality issue. I see a low protein, poor quality wheat issue. And I hope that you out there listening to this grow a 13.5 protein or better. I hope you get a big yield and I hope you get really good quality and that you can command a premium for that spring wheat. It's commanding a much larger premium over Kansas here uh, over the last couple of months. That, that's been improving. That spread's been getting wider between those two. So spring wheat growers are going to be a little bit more excited here. Uh, okay, what else do I have? Soybeans, they're bouncing a little bit. Corn's trying to bounce as well. Again, some weather, hot weather coming in there. But for me, folks, you know, at the end of this is, is to figure out how to sell this rally. This is not a recommendation today to, to execute, but to figure out how to sell this rally. Snug up your sales into uh, into the end of this calendar year. Make sure you got your cash flow in play. And then also get a little 2025 done as well. We're, we're going to focus on that too. Okay, so there's some hard work ahead of you folks. And I hope you're up for the challenge. I certainly am. Have some fun with it. And uh, hey, rallies are a good thing, always. And there's lots of different things you can do to take advantage of that. Uh, what else did I want to say on markets? I saw yellow peas. I saw 10 
in front of them in the Edmonton region now, the Edmonton Alberta region, ten fifty. If you're if you're still seeing prices north of eleven, eleven fifty, you probably want to bite that. Um, you know, I, I understand you can harvest and store them, and I think Kyle mentioned this a few weeks ago to store those yellow peas into the new year. But um, again, folks, we're just seeing this market starting to slide a little bit, and uh, it gets worse before it gets better. Uh, okay, now let's talk urea. And uh, I got my uh, I got my secret agent guy. Not allowed to really name names, but I I did reach out. I'm going to try to get a little more fertilizer context for you because the inbox, the What the Futures inbox is just blowing up. And in fact, this is, this is actually should slide into the uh, the Pioneer Seeds mailbox this week. So I, I'm going to add it right now because it's important and I want you to hear it. But the Pioneer Seeds mailbox did blow up with questions about buying fertilizer. And we saw a little uptick in urea prices. You know, I saw some... Some 650, and that then that went to 660, and then the guys that were 670 went to 680. But um, we did see NH3 prices drop just a little bit. Those are out now, folks. In the 11, 11, what was it? 1140 a ton. I should really reference my notes so I don't get into too much trouble. But right around there on the NH3. So I asked my buddy. I said, "Hey, man, happy July 23rd." Listeners are getting restless looking for a market outlook on urea. Are you seeing anything worthwhile that I can talk about? I don't see any urgency to buy, but I'm also a bit of a... I told him I was a bit of an idiot, but, you know, I don't know. And he says, don't worry, Ryan, you're a smart guy. Uh, there really isn't a lot going on in urea. There's a lot more interest in Canada, as we have seen very little engagement in the U.S. so far. A lot of folks are waiting to see where and if things settle after taking an initial position to have some tons through the first part of the summer. So how I'm going to deduce that, and again, folks, I'm no genius, but if I was selling fertilizer and I took on a small position, I need to sell that position. I'm going to try every little little trick in the bag, right? The classic one is to raise your price for a couple of days, get everyone nervous about it. And then they call in and say, hey, what's going on with prices going up? Okay, well, what can you do? I think I'm going to pull the trigger. And then they all of a sudden they say, hey, yeah, we can get a deal done. Let's drop it 10 bucks for you and away we go. <laughs> Anyways, folks, um, I, I believe that we're, we're going to be, I believe that the folks that are selling you urea right now, I'm just going to say this urea specific, they actually don't have a lot of conclusive evidence or conclusive facts that the urea market is going to climb or climb substantially. Because you got to remember, folks, money is still not cheap. So if you're going to put some money out there, you know, it, it could be at 5%, 6 7% interest, maybe it's at 10% interest. There's, there's a cost to that. And so I was asking farmers who were asking me, I'm like, okay, well, what, what's your retailer say? Like, what's their excuse? And I, I got a whole bunch of nothing. Like, a whole bunch of nothing. I, I even got a, well, because the price just goes up throughout the year. Uh, last year it didn't. Last year it went up and down and up and down and up and down. And of course, that spring price was always the highest. Not always, but it certainly was this last year. But it moves. It moves around, folks. And I, to me, I, I'm, a, I'm a still a bear in these markets. I'm a bear, a long-term bear in wheat, corn, soybeans, canola. <laughs> Urea <laughs> is in there, too. I'm a commodity bear yet. And I, hey... Oh, maybe. Hopefully, hopefully I'm, I'm wrong. I'd love to pay more for fertilizer and have prices go up 20% too, like commodity prices, right? Have canola and everything go up 20% would be great. And sure, I'll pay a bit more for my urea. But I don't think that's going to happen. And I think American farmers, when I look, listen to American analysts or, or read their stuff, they're trying to figure out how to how to break even here this year and next year. They're trying to figure out how to 
you know, mitigate losses. They're talking about severe cutbacks from U.S. farms on all sorts of different things. And inputs are going to be part of that. And I don't think the American farmers are excited to do anything right now. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised in Western Canada if we have a heck of a sale on uh, NH3 this fall. Because the American farmers are, are kind of sitting on their hands trying to figure out what to do. You know, I listened to one guy say the other day, he's like, well, thank goodness my clients, who are 21% hedged or sold, thank goodness they're going to get an extra 7 bushels of soybeans and an extra 30 bushels of corn because they're going to outrun their cost of production. They're going to use those bushels, extra bushels, to be profitable or close to profitable. But that can't be a reality for everybody. And to me, that still doesn't circle back to being bullish urea, that urea values are going to climb. And so my summer fill guys listening to this, I get it. I understand. I understand that you're a little bit stressed out because you always buy your fertilizer now. And nine times out of 10, 19 times out of 20, it is the right move. And it still could be the right move. I'm just not bought into it right now. I just think that there's still potential for prices at a worst case scenario to hold sideways. So you can keep your money in the bank, not pay that interest, maybe make 5% on it, and you'll still be further ahead. My buddy who texted me, what I deduce out of all that is that you've got your retailers in Western Canada that have a small position on that want to get rid of that small position at their profit of 40, 50, 60 bucks a ton. The faster they do it, the better, and then they'll come in and reposition again. And I think it's really small out there, folks. If you did buy already, though, you know, I just say make sure you're not sleeping at the wheel on your 2025 crop marketing. Be a, a alert because um, there can be some good decisions made on that front as well to help balance that out. But, folks, I don't know. I'm going to dig into this more. I'm going to try to get uh, an expert to join the show here in short order. And uh, I will certainly continue to share uh, with what I find out. All right, folks, let's see if we can bring in, uh, let's bring in a couple of clips here. Let's try to get, let's try to get Trent McRae with UPL. Let's try to fit him in and um, let's see what that gets us. Okay. We'll try to do Trent or SJHL. We'll see what the editor picks here. And uh, yeah, and we'll go from there. So come back yet for, uh, for eating your veggies. And we'll wrap up the episode after that as well. All righty, folks. I'm here with Trent with UPL. <laughs> Been hanging out at Egg in Motion all week here. Having a great time. Lots of fantastic. The team's had uh, a lot of fun here. And uh, Trent, why don't you just introduce yourself and your role at UPL? Thanks, Brad. I'm Trent McRae. I'm the country head for UPL at Grist Solutions Canada. Been with UPL for... Uh, Goodness, it's been over 20 years now. Wow. Different versions, the legacy companies that UPL's acquired along the way. We were, I was part of that. I used to be the first in science, yep. which is now incorporated into me. Yeah, it's been a great journey. Uh, I come from a farming background in Saskatchewan. So you say, yeah. this is, I live in Alberta now, and this is, uh, feels like coming home now. You're like me, because I'm from Saskatchewan as well, but also I live in Alberta now. And- we kind of have each side of Edmonton country. You're a little bit to the west, down to the east. Yeah, so the other are, are, we, are you a Williams fan? Oh, yes. It was <laughs> such a fun spring, and what? yet just a, a hard pill to swallow at the end. But lots of hope for next year. Yeah, I don't know. It was, it was something for sure. It was, yeah. it was a good experience. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, UPL, you know, 20 years, you know, within the organizations. You know, give us a little bit of background on UPL. And a little bit of history there. You can dive in a little bit and um, help the listeners understand. So, really exciting company to work for. Uh, you know, to be honest with you, you know, still relatively new in Canada. Although they've been here in a capacity, probably a little more Eastern based with their potato products, you know, over a course of a period of 10 or so years. But more recently, you know, they had part of Rista and you know, all the advancements since they grew up. But globally, you has you been around, oh, it's over 50, it's got to be about 55 years, 60 years now. And uh, based in India, is where uh, our base in a base manufacturing organization that, you know, over the course of the past 15 years, has really, really good. You know, 
I went back to 2005, I think it was something like 500 or globally. Now we're the fifth largest in the world. Yep. Compared to the Bay Area, the Bay Area, the Bay Area. Yeah. We're the fifth largest globally. So uh, a real significant growth path. And obviously, the domestic was part of that. We've got a seed division of Banta Seeds, which actually used to be based in the company as well. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of acquisitions along the way in different parts of the world. And really, uh, a lot of other strategic acquisitions in terms of one where the company wanted to just think of two portfolio development. What's, what's the changing environment of ag? What's the huge gap ag? And so, in addition to their all the product protection, they make sure that investments are possible. A lot of investment in biological is a global leader, a self revenue standpoint, an innovation standpoint, yeah. a global leader in the biological space. Uh, we're getting there in Canada. Obviously, yeah. with our regulatory process, it's really good to get there in Canada, but we don't have to do some very good uh, as such a strong bandwidth global push to Canada. Yeah, it's a fascinating. Is there a product in your portfolio right now that is a biological or do you the biological that you talk We would have. Uh, probably the most prevalent one is it's very new. Last year was really its probably its, its first year of launch. Uh, it's called Wave. It's a CD extract product. So it's uh, new to the market. There's been a lot of history behind CD extracts. Uh, you know, it's a few years now in Canada with a, a lot of companies for starting to participate in the space. But, you know, I really like that position as a leader in terms of not just the technology and the research and that what is the box, but also advancing the farm formulation side of the setting is actually giving the product and how that's reacting from the plants and then creating a consistency and performance by creating a consistent product as well. There's a lot of very good consistency. I have learned so much about seaweed and everything uh, over the last couple of days here. I think. You know, heading into egg and I think my biggest learning is to be the importance of reality. Um, but anyway, that's great. Um, okay, so under your logo, you have open egg. What is open egg? So open egg really, like it came together with a lot of the same things that we have for this whole life span of innovation and how we go about developing solutions and they're really being relevant, you know, not just now, as growers, solve the problem, it is but it's it's a more powerful than that but it's way to go down. So if I was to sum up open egg, it's collaboration. It's an innovative way to develop it. Historically, there's you know there's lots of different ways to get to market. There are indeed companies that are fairly focused in the world. what they've got you know, UPL has an element of that within our corporation as well. But we're also, you know, as we become a health and active this company, it's about all the entrepreneurs out there, so it's universities, whether it's startup companies, it's all sorts of development going on that we have a lot of skill in terms of developing and technology, partnering with companies like that, creating an open open network for the research and advancing technology for companies. Yeah. That's why the scientific base, but quick way. And that's yeah. it, it's about that collaborative so We're seeing more of that. We started that message probably four to five years ago now. Yeah. And now I'm going to start to hear that resonate elsewhere in the industry. So yeah. it's it's how it's good. Um, you know, we like to think we're probably the, the, the originator of the thought process a lot of it, but at the same time I think it's good for the policy. I think it's good for energy. Yeah. We're all moving quicker and we're bringing the solutions that we need to control. Collaboration, transparency, all value of the It's great. Um, so we're not quite done the 2024 growing season yet, but does anything stand out from UPL's perspective on this growing season? Um, maybe some of the components you guys have first. Well, like every year, it's uh, it becomes fraught with its challenges, yeah. but yet the excitement of all the things that are good for the growth as well. So it was a little challenging at the start, a little bit of a push later, and then it seems to be all so Even our Eastern Canadian business was delayed, but in the last two to three weeks, it's really advanced. And generally, I would say, you know, the different pockets, but generally, I would say, man, it talks about it. Yeah, you know, that's really exciting. And certainly, you know, we've been having a strong growers and getting those products. Lots of our new products we sold out of several of our new products. Yep. Uh, getting those out to market, the Wave, our Select Cash, which is a 
a new uh, new platform to work on combination uh, you know, our fungicide business is really well uh, this year as well as our uh, our big concern for the light product is really took a look as well so we're excited that uh, we launched five new products last year yeah um and to have those take off and get on the and really build that Growth and we're kind of growing and more of that understanding of the UPL is and the technology and the innovation of the business. Like that. And it's exciting, it's rewarding for the person who's out for us. Yeah, 100%. I know, you know, Vern, that we've sat in here, um, they've been uh, just talking about some of the products they've been using, some of the successes that we've seen up there. And, uh, say they're looking for more bushes to market. And this is really planning with this. Yeah. Uh, Trent, I appreciate your support of the Winter Features podcast. We have a fantastic team. We've been able to chat with a lot of them the last couple of days. A lot of energy. Uh, a lot of smart people as well. And uh, it's just been great. So I really thank you. So this is going to be the show on top of smart people. So I'm hoping I'm leading well because yeah. I think I've got a really bright team behind me. Yeah, they've been great. Awesome. Thanks so much, Trent. Thanks, Trent. Thanks, Trent. All right, folks. I, I again, I can't thank UPL enough. They treated me really, really well uh, at their booth, and uh, you know, we got all sorts of clips that we took. Again, uh, <laughs> the background noise was not our friend, uh, but uh, we did we did what we could, and uh, look for those later on throughout the year as well, and and uh, even later into this winter. Uh, all right, folks. Um, for eating your veggies here, let's let's uh, keep moving along. But for eating your veggies, uh, again, number one, you're sitting here, July, end of July. I want you to just your best guess at your yield production. You don't have to tell me because you know that if you send an emoji with what your crop looks like, I'm going to sell that information to the government. Um, but just assess your crop and do your best at at your yield prediction. I know it's hard and it feels impossible, but just try your best. From there, review your contracts and review your percent sold. And then your cash. What do you have for cash flow covered? Uh, what do you have? Any? What, what are your next gaps? What month is that where you have a gap? And then you can with confidence say, hey, I'm good for these months. I need money in X month, whatever that is. Maybe it's November, maybe it's December, maybe it's in the new year. And then you can formulate a plan to say, I have never done this contract, but I know that I need to take advantage of this rally. I don't want to face a buyout. Boom. What can I do? How can I tackle this? You know, how can this look? And so, you know, that's <laughs> that's number one, I guess, for eating your veggies. That, that was like five things right there. Um, but number two, this is a summer weather rally. Is this going to be something that, we look back and say, well, geez, this was the start of the next big wave higher because we didn't see rain again for the year and, and we had a production loss. Again, I, I'm i not in that camp, but we'll see, right? It's We're living it right now. I think it's a rally that you look back and say, darn, why didn't I do more? Darn, why didn't I try to figure out how to tackle this thing? Like, how, why didn't I figure out the scenario to sell and sleep at night? For our farm, I'm going to be honest, it's uncomfortable. You know, I'm talking to uh, uh, to my dad and my brother, and I'm saying, hey, guys, uh, this market's rallying. I'm going to continue to present options for the farm that allow you guys to sell at a profit, not face a buyout, and, uh, and try to get somewhere around 100% hedged. Because if it wants to go up from there later on, I feel very comfortable on, on coming up with the strategies to participate in that. And so I, what I can't do, what I can never do, I wish I could, but for some reason I haven't figured out how to let a market, a market peak pass me by and then two weeks later sit there and say, oh yeah, well that rally that happened, I want that again and I'm going to sell that this second time around. I can't figure out how to do that. I've, I never could. Maybe you can. If you know how to do that, let me know. So when I have the opportunity, I want to figure out how best to take advantage of it because I don't know how long it's going to last. All righty. So that, what was that? Number two, officially? Was that number two? But again, folks, we're, we're having uncomfortable conversations and I'm presenting the strategies to say, this is what I would do. This is how I would do it. This is the, if the market goes down, this is what it looks like. If it goes up, this is what it looks like. But let's protect margin. Let's protect 
value that we have out there. And I know you guys are listening and you're shaking your head like this guy, you know, this guy standing on this deck looking at that river. Um, what does he know? Like our farm here, it's hot out. The sun is hurting and damaging our crops. Why the heck would we be selling crop? <clears throat> well, folks, the market is also looking at it too. And they always overdoes it. They always think it's worse than what it is. Except for the real droughts of 21, the real droughts of 02. Um, and some of you are in a real drought as well today. I get that and I sympathize with that. But honestly, folks, it's just at this point, it's still not that bad. Okay. That's my opinion. Uh, number three, what could the number three thing? Hey, it's end of July. Take some vacation. Take some time off. You've been living in the sprayer. You've been, that's the other thing. Fungicide airplanes flying all over me right now uh, this week. It's a busy fungicide application. You don't spray fungicide if you're worried about not getting a crop, right? And I get it. Highway 16 North is wetter. Manitoba is wetter. Lots of fungicide application going on there. Central Alberta, dry. North Edmonton, dry. Southern Saskatchewan, southwest, southwest Saskatchewan, dry, right? But there's still lots of fungicide going on in all sorts of areas too. Um, take some time to yourself. Go go fishing, go golfing, do, do what you enjoy. Enjoy some vacation, some off time. You guys do not get very much vacation or off time. You don't get to turn off very much at all in the summer, if at all, right? You know, I'm at my father-in-law's. We're you know, were, <laughs> he's raking hay, he's bailing, you know, I did hand him like a couple of nuts. Uh, he was re repairing a, a tire. I'm like, here, I'll hold this for you. And like, you know, that's been my usefulness out here. Uh, but the point is lots of guys are hanging too, and there's just not a lot of time to, to shut down. Harvest is around the corner. The heat's going to move this crop along. So make sure you get a little bit of downtime, whatever that is for you. Uh, an evening, a day, a week. Uh, just take some of that because you'll need it before you get into harvest. Uh, all right, folks, I, I hope you enjoyed episode number 36. Again, um, a bit of a hodgepodge out there. Uh, of course, fun recording on the deck here. I'll be back in the UPL studio uh, next week. And uh, yeah, if you like the show, tell your friends. Uh, we are, it's a, it's a little show, folks. It's a little show for Western Canadian farmers. Um but it is building a little bit of momentum here right now. And it's because of you. You tell your friends, you tell your buddies, you tell your neighbors. And uh, I appreciate it. I certainly do. So thanks for uh, tuning into this show. Episode 36. Stay safe out there. Take care. I'm out. <laughs>